Hello and welcome to today's presentation, BIM for Buildings with Dynamo. My name is Drew Jarvis and I'm an application specialist with Cancel in Vancouver, BC. Cancel is with you wherever you are in Canada, with 17 locations providing field to finish solutions. Cancel is an Autodesk Platinum reseller, serving the AEC, ENI, manufacturing and government industries. We've been providing Autodesk solutions for over 28 years. Prior to today's presentation of Dynamo, I wanted to take a moment to ensure that you are aware of the changes coming to license availability for Autodesk products. Did you know that perpetual licenses will not be available for individual products after January 31st, and for suites like the Building Design Suite after July 31st? By purchasing perpetual licenses now, you can continue to use them as long as you maintain an active maintenance subscription on the license. So what happens after those deadlines? Well, desktop subscription is the future of licensing for Autodesk products, whether they are single hero products like AutoCAD and Revit, or suites like the Building Design Suites. Whether your projects are temporary or ongoing, you can keep software costs manageable and predictable. Pay only for the access you need, without an upfront investment or long-term commitment. Companies grow, projects expand, employees don't stay in one place. Be prepared for whatever changes come your way with licensing that scales to meet your organization's needs. Stay competitive with the latest Autodesk technology. Get the most up-to-date software releases with the level of technical support you need. Stay current with newsletters and communications for subscribers. Work smarter without tying up your desktop. Get access to additional services in the cloud, such as faster rendering and visualization capabilities, collaboration tools, and secure storage. Contact your local Cantel office if you have any questions about the upcoming license changes that will affect you and your company. Now, let's take a look at the featured BIM workflow of today's presentation. Dynamo is a product that works with your existing design software. I will be basing my presentation on the integration of Revit and Dynamo. So what is Dynamo? Well, Dynamo is a visual programming tool enabling you to gain access to the power of automation in a very simple to use interface. You may have seen some of the amazing modeling that is available with Dynamo, but I want to show you some of the applications that can affect engineering for buildings. I'm going to show you some of the script examples, including the ability to round trip between Revit and Excel. Dynamo simply allows you to place nodes that perform an action on the inputs you provide. For example, if I provide two numbers as X and Y on the left side of the addition node, the node will add them together and provide the result on the right hand side. You can also use Dynamo to get data from the Revit project model. In the example on the screen, I define a category so that I can select all of the elements of that category in the project model I then use the last node to get a list of the parameter values from the selected elements. The string node is used to provide the name of the parameter we want. Note that the results in the watch window at the bottom of the node. Similarly, you can put data in the Revit model with Dynamo. I can define a category so that I can again select all of the elements of that category in the project model. I then use the last node to input the parameter values into the selected elements. The string node is used to provide the name of the parameter we want to update, and the number node is used to provide the value of the parameter we want to update. Dynamo can be opened from Revit and has a fairly simple interface. There are menus and toolbars along with a library of available nodes. You place a node and wires in the workspace and you can use the execution bar in order to run the script at a particular point in time or to set the script to run continuously. Placing a node just requires you to define the required node. This is done by either right-clicking in the workspace area or searching the library. Nodes are then connected by wires. You simply click on the right side of a node and then on the left side of another node to connect the data. Let's take a quick look at how easy it is to get started with Dynamo. Go to dynamobim.org slash download. 
and you'll have two different downloads you can try. The free version that works with Revit 2015 and 2016, and then Dynamo Studio, which is a paid for standalone version. So we can use the free version because we have Revit. We're going to hit download. You can see it's version 0.9.0, .0, and we'll just wait for that to download. So now I have Dynamo downloaded, and I'm going to double click and run the application. It's a very simple install. We're just going to click next. And in a few moments, we'll have Dynamo ready to go. Once it's been installed, we'll just run Revit and we'll see where the Dynamo shortcut has been placed. So now I'm loading up Revit 2016 and I'm just going to take a look at a very simple implementation of Dynamo to get started. We'll just open up architectural template here. I'm going to go to the add-ins tab and here's Dynamo 0.9. We'll click that to open it up and here we have our Dynamo. So I'm going to press on new and just kind of introduce the interface a little bit. So up here we can see the menu, the toolbar, the library area, the workspace area and the execution bar. So what we do is we spend most of our time here placing nodes, attaching them with wires, and having this affect the model. It's a very simple example of Dynamo. Let's place in an addition node. I'm just going to right click. I'm going to search for the addition node. And then over here I just need to place a couple of values. By double clicking I get a thing called a code block. Here I can put in numbers with a semicolon to differentiate between each line. As you can see, what I'll be able to do is just say, this is X, this is Y, and then down the bottom here, I can have a little watch window to show me what's going on. So there's lots of different types of node available. This is a plus. We could, of course, do multiplication. We can do different formulas. Lots of different types of things can be done. For example, we could place an if statement just using a formula box. So I can say if x is greater than 6, then y otherwise z. So what you'll see is we have then the parameters that we've defined available here. So I could place in a code block for my number, link that to x. and then have different values for y and z. So if x is greater than 6, y, otherwise z. Let's take a look. So we're getting 20 at the moment. As we put this up to 7, we get 10. Simple things like this are very easy to accomplish using Dynamo. Other examples that we can use are the ability to get information from the model. So in my model here, I'm going to draw a wall. And then here, I'm going to use a select model element. Now to select model element, I can select this element here. And you'll see here's the element ID of it. And then I can start to get information about it. So for example, maybe I want to know the length of the wall. Well, I just simply right click and put into here, get parameter. You see this is element dot get parameter value by name. So as long as I have an element and I have a parameter name, I can get the value of that parameter. So let's try putting in a string value here. Interestingly, I can use code blocks or strings to define a string. With the string, I'm going to say this is the length. Attach those two. And you can see there is the length of that wall. As I mentioned, the code block could also be used. There I would just put it in brackets, semicolon at the end, and drop that in there. So these things are interchangeable. Let's say we have more than one element. 
If I wanted to select more than one element, I could select model elements. And here we can see, here's a select. Come over here, and then we just have to window the objects we're interested in. Now when we connect this into the get parameter, what we get is a list of objects. So each of the objects is given a, a position in the list, and then the value for the length is in there. This is what's going to be coming out of here. The opposite of the get parameter, of course, would be the set parameter. So here we could, for example, use this same select model elements. We could then make use of the parameter unconnected height. It needs to be case specific, of course. Let's just go and view this in a 3D view. And then if we set the value, just using a code block, let's try setting it to, to 3000 and click out of the code block, you can see it updating in the model. So we're seeing very, very basic information that we can use inside of Dynamo here, but it can run and modify objects in the model, and gather information from the model. Now, quite the important part is the execution down here. It's quite useful when you're playing with the model to set it to manual, meaning that it only affects the model when you hit run. So I can change the number here to 5000, and it's not going to affect anything here until I hit run. Then it affects the model. This can be a good thing in case you get errors, and you don't want those errors getting put straight into the model. If you're then just running the Dynamo later, set it to automatic, and everything just happens in real time. So that's a very, very basic starting introduction to Dynamo, just about the data. Now that we've seen how easy it is to get started, let's take a look at a more practical application. The space naming utility is an add-in that comes very useful when you bring an architectural model as a link into your project file. It enables you to synchronize the room data with your space data. However, it's not always available immediately upon release of the software. So let's see how easy it is to replicate the functionality using Dynamo. Replication of the space naming utility is relatively straightforward. I'm going to start here by just creating myself an architectural template. And now I'm going to draw a few walls. And then place some room objects inside. Place my first room, change it to room number 101, and place in the other rooms. I can change some of the names of these. And with those in place, I'm just going to save this file. as my architectural background. Close that down. And now I'm going to start myself up a second project. This time it's going to be a mechanical project. And then I'm going to link the architectural file into it. So with my architectural background in place and rooms inside of it, typically I would then place some space objects. And you see now I've got my six spaces. However, they just named with numbers from one through six and they're all called space. So this doesn't match up with the room information. In fact, if I pick the space here and take a look at its properties, I can see it has space and two and it knows that the room in the background is called dining and 102. So there is an add-in called the space naming utility and that utility can be used to match the values. However, you need to find where they've uh, uploaded it this year. It seems that every year it could be hosted in a different location. 
and you also have to wait for it to be created each year. It may not come out the same day that the software is released. So with Dynamo, we can very quickly and easily replicate that. I'm going to go and open up Dynamo. I'm going to simply place seven nodes. So here's Dynamo. We can see some menus along the top, our toolbar area, library, workspace, and then the execution bar down the bottom. I'm going to turn my execution bar to manual for now, and then start placing nodes. So first of all, I want to get all of my spaces. So I'm going to go and find categories node, and set this to MEP spaces. I'm then going to select all elements of that category. and simply just link those. Now within the space we have the data for the room name as well as the space name. So I'm going to perform a get parameter which is going to allow me to get the space name. So I'm going to run the elements into there and then I need to place the parameter name. So just with a simple double click I can get a code block where I can place in some text. So this is going to be my room name. We link that in, and then if I hit the item at the end to watch and then hit run, we can see the names of the rooms from the project. So I'll add in the room number, and make a duplicate just with a copy paste, and then link the room number to this one and let's do a quick run on that one too. There we go, so now we have our name and our number. The next thing I want to do is to set the parameter. So I want to take that room number and place it into the space number. So here's my set parameter. The set parameter requires the elements to be modified, the name of the parameter which will be name and number, and then the value which is actually going to come from the get parameter here. So to test this process on the names, I'm going to do my elements into here. I'm going to create an additional code block. I could actually just use the same one, but I'm going to put another one over here so I don't have too many lines overlapping. I'm going to take the name as the parameter name, and then the value is going to be from here. Similarly, for the number, I'm going to take the number value and link that into the parameter name and the parameter values from here. So currently it's set to null and what I'm going to do is just move my dynamo over to the side so we can see what actually happens when I hit run. Taking a look at our code here as I hit run. You can see information is populated in here, just indicating that it has put the spaces all the way through to the end and it's updated their information. But more importantly over here we can see that the kitchen is 101, this is dining 102, games 103, etc. So now whatever we do to the model, if we go and change the architectural values, we won't have any problem. If essentially I can change this to something else. As long as I hit run, it's going to update it to whatever the room data is. So you can see in a couple of minutes I've managed to replicate the space name and utility using Dynamo. Another application of Dynamo is in the ability to take the information from a room and use it to number doors. Let's take a look at how Dynamo can help with this. When creating doors inside a Revit, it's sometimes useful to be able to relate the door number to the room number that they associated with. Let's see what happens when we just place a door normally. We have tag on placement, we place a door, and it becomes door number one. 
subsequently door number two, door number three. If we were to change it, for example, to 233, the next door would just simply become 234. So it simply, it simply takes the last digit of the mark and increments it. Now, what if we could use Dynamo to relate the door number to the number that it opens up into? Let's see if that's possible. We're going to open up a new Dynamo and we're going to collect all of the doors. So we can get all the elements. Link those together. Set this to door. And then we're going to find the room information. Now, the room information isn't just as simple as a property or parameter on the door, unfortunately. If we take a look at the door here. However, if we edit the family and take a look at this door in the ground floor plan, there is a object called the room calculation point. Now, when we check this, what we get is the two room on this side and the from room on this side. So if we load that back into the project, overwriting the existing, the door will now know about its two room and its from room. Again, properties don't show it, but that's the beauty of using Dynamo. Dynamo gives us access to some of those hidden parameters in the background because it can access the Revit API. Now, in order to access this information, we will need to make use of some Python script. So I'm going to right click and look for Python. And then in order to actually place the script into here, we simply double click on this area down the base. But I'm just going to copy all of this, delete it and paste in what I need. Now we can see here that it's going to import some information. So we're importing the Revit API as well as Revit services and Revit nodes. We're then stating the document here and then the family instances as the input zero. So you can see here input zero. So we're saying whatever comes into input zero becomes family inst. We're then declaring an array of elements. And then we're saying for every object, if you like, of I inside of the family instances, we're going to unwrap the element. We're then defining some statements. So to get the to room and to get the from room. We're then defining some more arrays here. We've got room number, room name, doors and room. We're going to try and get the to room and we're going to try and get the from room. So then if the from room is none and the to room is none, basically we're just appending information saying there is no to or from room. However, if the to room is not equal to none, then we're going to get the parameter for the name and the number. We're then going to append that information to the room number and room name array, as well as the door information and the room information. So you can see here then the out, which comes out here, is the room number, room name, doors and room. So we'll finish that and then we can see it's it's saying nothing's coming into it. So let's bring this in. And there we go. What do we get on the outside? We get those four arrays that we defined. So taking a look at this again, the four things that we have, the four arrays that we defined to be out were room number, room name, the doors, and then the particular room that they're associated with. So from this information, what I'm interested in doing is extracting just certain parts of it, the room number and the particular door, because I want to take the door and assign the room number to it as the door number. Now, this is actually very easy with a code block. So what I can do, for example, is say the room number is equal to in zero room name is equal to in one door is equal to in two and room 
is equal to example in B. As I bring this information into it, we then get, for example, if I was to place a watch here, that the room numbers are here, room names, door objects, and room objects. So now all I need is a set parameter. I'm going to take the doors and set the parameter called mark to the room number. Straight away over here we can see starting to get information from the room number going into the door. If I was to change the room number, my door is going to change. If I flip the door into the other room, again, my door number is going to change. So I'm sure with Python I could set it up to take notice of the particular doors and increment an A, B, C, D. Um, but in my instance here, what I've done is a bit more straightforward. I've just taken the door tag, taken the label, and introduced a shared parameter, which is going to be door number suffix. And then we'll just make sure that's on the project as well. So now this one can be A, and this one can be B. So a very simple little piece of Dynamo, just a few nodes as you can see. And these nodes enable us to replicate the room number onto the door number. Moving into more of a engineering workflow now, let's take a look at how easy it is to take space information and populate air terminal engineering data. In the following example, I'm going to show how you can use Dynamo to take information from the space and populate air terminal objects. So in this model here, I have some space objects. And once we've run some heating cooling calcs or some other type of analysis, we may end up with some calculated supply airflows. And we could also then put in some specified supply airflows. This is the type of information that we can then use to put data into the air terminals in the room. So for example, if I was to take my space object here and have 300 liters per second as a requirement, what I might want to do is then have 75 liters per second on each of my air terminals. Let's take a look at how we can automate that process using Dynamo. So first of all, I'm going to switch over into Dynamo and open up a new environment. So my basic workflow is that I'm going to want to select all of my air terminals in the model and then take a look at these against one of the spaces. So it's going to be a bit of a manual process, as in it's per space, but it's also going to be a bit automated because it's going to take a look at the whole model and see which air terminals are in that space. So I need to first of all collect all of my air terminals. Now air terminals in Dynamo are known as duct terminals. This comes from the fact that it uses the Revit API, and so some of the terminology can be a little bit different. So I'm going to want to group all of those together. Then I want to select the elements geometry. So if I take a look at it at the moment, you can see it's bringing up the solids from eight air terminals that have been my project. Here in the project, we can see four air terminals here and eight air terminals here. Now what I want to do is have the Dynamo run this against the space object. I'm going to pick the space object individually just for simplicity at this stage. So we're going to select an object. We 
we're then going to find the geometry of that object. So I can take this one, copy, paste, and link. And then I'm going to use a node that checks if they intersect. Next up, we want to check for intersection. So we use a node called does intersect. Here we place the space geometry and the duct terminal geometry. And we just want to set the lacing here to cross product. What we'll find here is it brings us a list that shows whether the objects intersect or don't intersect. So we have four that do and four that don't. And again, this can be easily checked to see how it's working. For example, we can minimize Dynamo. We can take one of these air terminals and move it outside of the space. Go back to Dynamo and we'll see that our result now is three trues and five falses. Now what we're gonna to want to do is get the supply airflow from the space. So we're gonna put in here a get parameter and we're gonna link the space into there. And we're gonna place a code block that looks for the specified supply airflow parameter. And link that into here. And we can see a value of zero. That's okay. Let's check it by going back to the model, selecting our space, and just putting in the value here of, let's say, 88. Here we can see the number value coming up as 3.108. So what we can see is that Dynamo uses the units that Revit uses in the background. Now they are always imperial units. So liters per second is metric, and so the value that we're seeing here is the imperial version. So there might be some conversion required if you wanted to display this on the screen. However, we're not going to be displaying it other than putting it into the air terminals. So it's OK if everything in the background works in imperial. Now we have a couple of things left. First of all, we want to find out how many air, air terminals intersect that space. That will allow us to figure out how much we need to divide this number by. So we have four air terminals. We have a value of 3.1. We need to divide 3.1 by 4 and then apply that value back to each of the air terminals. So in order to do that, what we're going to use is a filter by Boolean mask. Essentially, this allows us to take the yeses and the noes and separate them. Now, if I just take the Booleans here, you'll see that it's not a single list. It's actually a, a whole bunch of sublists. So what we want to do is flatten this list. So inside of here, I'm going to put a flatten. And then as we place this list into here, we can see we result in just the sub values in a single list, which can then go into here. So we after this has been placed in as the list, we also want to tell it what the different values are. So in the mask, we're also going to drop that into there as well. And then we're going to place a watch. And what we'll see in the output is that we have four trues and four falses. So let's place a count into here. Put the ins into there. And we can say the result is four. Now, I mentioned that we're going to take the value for the specified airflow and divide it by the count value. So we're just going to drop in a new one here, which is the division node. And we're going to take the 3.108 and divide it by the count. And there we go. There's our value of 0 0.777. So now we're getting close. All we need to do now is take this value and apply it back to the air terminals. So in order to get the value of 0 0.777 onto the objects, we're going to need to use this Boolean mask in order to take the air terminal elements and mask them by whether they intersect or not. And then we're going to use a set parameter where we can take the elements, the value, and then inside of here, the name of the parameter. So this is our end result. 
and if we go back to Revit, you can see here 22 liters per second has appeared on the objects. So if I take my space, change the value to 225, it'll recalculate and put 56.3. So is this always going to be the design criteria required? No, perhaps not. But we can see, we can take information, we can let Dynamo figure out, are these objects connected to each other, in this case because of them being in the same space in the model? And if they are, it can then take data, manipulate the data, and then push that data out to the elements in the model. Next up, we have an example of using the engineering data inside of the model and having it help us display on the screen where we have design challenges. Now, one of the things in Revit that bugs me <laughs> is that if I look at the objects in the model, if I scroll down here, we can see there is a pressure drop value for this object. There is a pressure drop value for this object. There is a pressure drop value for this object. However, sometimes there is not a pressure drop. So if I pick this takeoff here, which has the same size at each end, what happens is that the software figures, well, let's take a look at the ASHRAE table. It does its little thing in the background and it finds no ASHRAE table. And so it defines no pressure drop. So what we end up with is certain objects within the model that are incorrectly specified regarding their pressure drop, which makes it difficult to then use the model for calculations and trust the calculations are 100% accurate. It's not a big thing, but it's a thing. So what I like to do is to uh, kind of check this in my model and see which objects uh, have the correct value and which ones don't. However, one of the problems with that is that you can't use a normal schedule. Uh, you can't use color schemes inside of the view in order to show this zero value. So what Dynamo allows me to do is color objects on the screen based on certain parameters. So I figured why not make a very small little Dynamo and it's going to help me out with this check that I need to do every so often. So let's have a look at how I did it. So first of all, what I want to do is find the duct fittings. Here's my duct fitting. Here's my elements. Of that category. And then I'll want to get the pressure drop value from them. So I'm going to use a get parameter. I'm going to take those elements along with a code block that looks for the pressure drop string. And let's see what we get. So we have lots of objects that have a pressure drop and some that don't. So number five, number seven, 10, and 12, which I would guess are these ones. What I want to do now is get a list of all of those that have a pressure drop that is zero, basically. So I'm going to put zero into here, and then I'm going to put a greater than here. And essentially, what I'm going to look for is, are these objects greater than zero? So what I end up with are some booleans, a bunch of falses, and a few nulls. So the nulls are the ones I'm interested in because these are the values that are empty. They don't say zero because they failed in the finding of the ASHRAE table. They just have a null value. So the nice thing about nulls is I can look for them. So if I take these objects here, now what I get is some trues instead. Now trues are much more useful because with trues, I can use a Boolean mask. So I'm going to put in a Boolean mask here. I'm going to be using this set of true and falses as my mask. So now that the Boolean is in for the mask, all I need to do is bring in the actual elements. So I'll go over to elements, bring that into here. And you'll see what I now have is the four objects that are in one list, and then the 10 objects that are in another list. You'll notice here that the name of them is in here. So the 1.5 W is the elbow, clearly. What I now need to do is set up a color and color the elements. So let's take a look in our nodes. You can see we've got a color one here, which is very easily set up by just using a code block. I can go 255 for the red, 
and zero for the green and blue and we'll just simply link those in and then we want an override color so that color is going to go into here and our elements well that's over here that's going to be the in value and you can see over in the model the four red highlights for the objects that have a null value in their pressure drop. And for the final example, let's take a look at how we can round trip using Excel and Revit. I have here a document that just has a whole bunch of spaces inside of it. Now the spaces have information on them regarding engineering. Inside of the energy analysis here, under people, we can see there is an area per person value for the occupancy. Going over to a schedule, we can see here each of the spaces have perhaps different values. So what if we wanted to modify this information inside of Excel and then bring it back into the project? Well, Dynamo makes it very easy. I'm not going to go through creation of every single step today. I'm just going to show you the Dynamo and the results. So we start by creating categories with MEP spaces. Remember anything you see here can be created just by right clicking in a space and typing in a name. So here's my categories for example. We then take all elements of that category to get all of the spaces in the model. And then what we're interested in finding is a parameter named number of those MEP spaces. I then want to check for any of them that are unoccupied because if I take a look at my model some of my spaces here are unoccupied so they don't have the appropriate placement inside of the model and so they can be ignored. So by placing the does not equal into here I can then use that in a boolean mask where I take the elements in the model the does not equal is the mask and then my result here is a list or two lists one which is going to show me the objects that don't equal unoccupied and the other which do equal unoccupied. Obviously I'm interested in the ones that do not equal unoccupied. I then take information from the list of spaces that I have here and I take the element ID, I take the number, the name, number of people, area per person, you can see all these different values and I create lists of them. So I take all of that information and bring it together in a list create. This combines everything into one list, which then in order to get it in the correct format that I want for Excel, I need to just transpose. Transposing just switches the rows and the columns. And then I use a simple write to Excel where I have a file path. I have a string for the name of the sheet inside of the Excel file. I tell it that I'm starting in the top left, zero for row, zero for column, and that I do want to overwrite any existing data that's in there. Then I simply take my information here and write it. So if I go ahead, so if I go ahead and hit run, it opens up my Excel file and writes the information to it. So here you can see 2020, 33, 33, 2010. Let's go back to the model. And we have the same information here, 20, 20, 33, 33, 20, 10, etc. So now inside of Excel, I can make changes. Let's say I don't do anything particularly <laughs> accurate now, but I'll just do this one plus one and then just kind of drag this down, make this one 15 equals that one plus one, drag that down equals this one minus one. And drag that down. You can see I'm just getting a bunch of different values inside of here. All these different spaces. So I could put some very complicated formulas into Excel and do a whole bunch of calculations inside of here, whatever I need to do. Once that data is all ready to go, I switch back into my Dynamo, close down this Dynamo and open up the importing one. And inside of here, we can see what we're doing on two different 
paths here. Uh, the bottom one is taking the file, the Excel file, reading that file from the new sheet. So it's going to transpose it so that it's in the useful format that it needs. And then I'm looking for information in column four. So if we take a look at Excel, we can see column number four is zero, one, two, three, four. So there's that column that has all of our area per person data. And so it's taking that information and storing it as a list. Up here, it's taking the MEP spaces, all of them in the model. And then it's looking for any that's number equals unoccupied and it's removing them from the list using the filter by Boolean mask. And then over here, we're setting the parameter. And what we're saying is, well, here's our list of spaces. Here's our value or our parameter name, sorry, the area per person. And then here's the information that's come from the Excel file that's just been read. So if I put this side by side with my document here and hit run, you can see the information inside of Revit getting updated based on the data that I've got inside of my Excel file. Absolutely the most straightforward thing possible. This can be saved, it can be reused. If we want to do more than one, obviously we just need to create a few more get items at index. So if I'm interested in different columns here, I just need to put a different number in. So this is column six, eight, one, zero. You get the idea. And then we will just put a few more of these set parameters into our Dynamo script here.